Hello everyone. Welcome to the second lecture of the second module, which is on quality metrics. And this is also the fourth lecture of the course. The disclaimers remain the same. So in the last lecture, we were discussing about you know quality metrics, which was noise margin. So noise margin basically tells you how robust your circuit is against noise. Which noise? The noise which is injected when you know there are two gates in cascade, right? So whenever there are two gates which are cascaded, you will have one driving gate and one gate which is being driven. So in between those two gates, the node which is there, I mean the intermediate node between input gate and the output gate, the maximum amount of noise that can be tolerated there without you know degrading the performance or without affecting the performance overall performance of your circuit. So that is what was called as noise margin. So it tells you robustness against noise which is injected at that intermediate node whenever your gates are cascaded. But there are also a few other parameters related to noise. One of them is noise immunity. So what exactly this noise immunity means? It means that what is the capability of your circuit to reject noise sources? I mean, uh, there are some circuits which have you know even very low noise margin, but they are able to reject noise sources. And even in the presence of large value of noise, they are able to you know perform well. So how exactly those designs work, or what exactly you know helps them to do that? So yeah, these, those designs are typically capable of rejecting noise. What do you mean by rejecting noise? So you know these noise sources they are distributed across the circuit. So at the signal node under consideration, how these noise sources are coupling to it. That is also one aspect which is very important and that is covered under this umbrella of noise immunity. So noise margin, it's like in the intermediate node when you are cascading two gates, what is the maximum amount of noise that can be tolerated without affecting the performance. But noise immunity tells us what is the capability or what exactly you know, is the efficiency of this circuit with respect to rejection of noise sources. I mean with respect to uh, decoupling or I would say how well it is in you know uh, mitigating the impact of noise sources on a signal node which are important for circuit operation. So first criterion for that is your transfer function between the noise source or the source where the noise is being generated and the signal node under consideration that should be pretty less than one. That is a very small amount of that noise source should be coupled to this signal node. That is what I mean. And what are the different noise sources? We already discussed them. So they can be you know, internal, which are mainly because of the coupling, because you have interconnects or wires placed so close to each other. So you know there is capacitive coupling, also there is an inductive coupling, depending upon whether you are sweeping voltage or you are like working with, like you are changing the voltages or you are changing the currents. And this internal noise, we told that it's you know generated in, like it's internal to the device and it's proportional to the signal swing, which is also called the logic swing. So if your logic swing or signal swing is VSW, then it's simply a factor G multiplied by this VSW. I mean, it's just a, it's, it can be represented or it is usually represented as a fraction of this overall signal swing. The other source I told was, you know, fixed noise, which was coming out of the supply rails or the ground rails. And this fixed noise is kind of modeled as VNF, where VNF is the noise amplitude and this function F. What is F? F is kind of the transfer function from the noise source to the signal node. And you know, if the F is very small, then you can say that, you know, the design is capable of rejecting these fixed noise sources. Now let us see how exactly we can relate the noise margin to these sources of noise. So ideally, uh, let us say that, you know, uh, my gate is close to an ideal gate or my noise margin high is equal to noise margin low. And they're spanning the entire logic swing. That is you know, noise margin high equal to noise margin low and both are equal to your V swing by two. And what is the largest V swing possible? Largest V swing possible is your supply voltage, right? If your VOH is VDD, if your uh, VOL is ground, then maximum swing is VDD. So let's say that the noise margin, that is it's like uh, the case we are considering is for an ideal gate, it's symmetric, like NMH is equals to NML, and it's largest, that is, you know, NMH plus NML equals to VDD. That is, both are equal to 0.5 times VSW, VSW, let's say it's VDD or even for any other VSW, as long as it's symmetric and largest, it works fine. So then noise margin has to be higher than contribution of all these noise sources, right? At that particular node. So this noise margin here, it's V swing by two, and that has to be larger than 
sum of all these external noise sources or sum of all these fixed noise sources and sum of all these internal noise sources right so now this kind of gives you a relationship i mean if you solve this ex expression for vsw it kind of gives you an expression for vsw to you know uh, kind of have noise sources under control or for circuit to work properly this is the criteria on vsw so this should be the case right your noise margin should be larger than the contribution of all the noise sources at that particular node so that your circuit functions properly and this gives you this criteria on your uh, switching or like on your uh, logic swing or signal swing what this expression simply means is you know when you have a very large noise swing then it can like it can minimize the impact of these fixed noise sources so if you have a very large v swing then the impact of these fixed noise sources can be minimized at the same time if in your circuit the contribution or this internal noise is large or this coupling is large in your circuit then this impact of g if it is large i mean the gain factor if it is large then increasing the noise swing or sorry increasing the voltage swing or the logic swing that doesn't help you much why because you know the noise also increases as your v swing increases so criterion i would say like what you exactly want from the circuit you want exactly your like you know logic swing or signal swing to be large so that you know you want to suppress these impact of fixed noise but at the same time if the value of this g is large or you know if internal noise sources are large then this doesn't work out so there has to be trade off even here you have to first look out whether you know uh, the coupling is large or the fixed noise is large typically in circuits this fixed noise is large so you know we want to have as large voltage swing as possible so this is the kind of conclusion that we can draw from here we need large voltage swing but at the same time we need to be very careful whether you know the noise is dominated by fixed noise or it is dominated by the uh, coupling noise or the internal noise now another parameter or another property or i would say another quality metric of the gate is directivity so ideally what we want is we want that our gate should be unidirectional that is you know the gate should only propagate signals along one direction output should be decoupled from the inputs or there should not be any coupling between the output signal to any unchanging input signal see the output will change only when when you know once your your inputs are changed however there can be multi input gates and in those multi input gates when the output is changing because of one changing input it should not you know give a feedback kind of signal or you know it should not be coupled to the inputs which are not changing at that time because if it is coupled to those inputs which are not changing it will appear like a noise right so what i exactly mean is there should not be any feedback or coupling of output signal to any unchanging input signal because that is reflected as input noise however in real designs there has a feedback like there is a feedback path between your output to the input and to any unchanging input signal and because these gates are you know uh, very complex they are designed in a very complex manner and one of the factors which kind of you know uh, leads to coupling between output and input is this gate to drain capacitance of a mosfet i'll be discussing this in detail uh, when i'll be discussing you know the internal capacitance components of your cmos inverter but for the time being just let me tell you that inputs are typically applied at the gate of the mosfet and output in digital circuits is typically taken at the drain of the mosfet so input is applied at the gate output is taken at the drain if there is a capacitance between the gate and drain terminal then the input will be coupled to the output through that capacitance right and cgd is one capacitance of the mosfet which connects input to the output and you know if there is a gain in between i mean if there is some gain also if dv out by dv in is greater than 1 then you already know that you know if inputs and outputs are connected by a capacitor that capacitor is called miller capacitor and you use miller approximation to you know uh distribute that capacitance on the output side as well as on the input side for one you multiply it with 1 plus a and for one you divide it by 1 by 1 plus a right so that also will understand how exactly that miller effect you know uh, kind of affects this uh, feedback component of the uh, capacitance that is cgd so we will discuss that later i guess in e210 you already have some understanding of a miller capacitor so that also comes into picture over here that is what i wanted to discuss but we'll be discussing them in great detail when we go about you know understanding the internal capacitance components of mosfets when we study about cmos static inverters
So that would be the next module. So we'll be going ahead and do, doing that. But for the time being, just understand that inputs are generally applied at the gate, outputs are generally taken at the train, and there is a capacitance which is known as CGD of MOSFET, which kind of connects the input to the output. And because of this Miller effect, and since the gain can be larger than one, its impact can be even you know uh, dangerous. So that is what I wanted to you know convey to you. So how should we design? We should design to minimize the coupling. So that you know, change in the outputs are not reflected to the changes, or change in the outputs are not reflected at unchanging input signals. Because that is kind of you know, if that is reflected, I mean, if there is a change in the output, and if that is coupled to the unchanging input signal, that is reflected as input noise. So we do not want to act like you know, apart from those sources of noise which are like inherent to the system, or which are coming out of you know supply voltages and all. We don't want to add any new uh, you know input noise sources. Because we have to compensate for that, we have to work around that. So we do not want to add complexity to our system. So we want our you know uh, coupling between input and output stages to be as low as possible. Now another quality metric is fanning. So what exactly is fanning? So fanning is nothing but you know number of inputs to any gate. So there can so inverters are only one input gate, right? NAND gates, NOR gates, there are two input gates. So the number of fanning or the number of inputs to the gate is two. So fanning is two. For any generalized gate. If there are like you know m number of inputs to the gate, the fanning is m. However, this fanning also dictates you know the design of these circuits, design of these gates. How exactly? So if you have a large fanning, then the design will be complex. It will be a very complex design, and you know it will be bigger, and it will be slower. So if you are making it in a single stage, I mean if you are making a gate. Which is single stage. I mean, there is only one bit. You are not decomposing it into several number of stages. Large number of fanings simply mean that you know if you are making it in a single stage, then it, the circuit will be bigger and it will be slower. So typically, what people do is when you have a large number of fanings, they kind of divide it into number of stages. So let's say two input per stage, or you know uh, three inputs per stage. So they kind of divide it into number of stages. By that, what they kind of achieve is they achieve kind of a better performance as compared to when they are making it using a single stage. However, there comes complexity there, you know, because the design of stages, how the individual stages are designed, and how you are allocating these inputs to all those stages. That is also very tricky because you know even the order of inputs, like order of coming of inputs in these multi fan in or I would say in this uh, logic gates with multiple fan ins, that also dictates the delay. That also dictates you know the design. So the inputs which change very fast or inputs which are changing frequently, they should be made as close to the, or they should be placed as close to the output stage as possible. So those things will become clear when I discuss about you know combinatorial circuit design. But at, for the time being, you should just understand that you know even the designing of these individual stages and the allocation of inputs, how exactly the inputs are changing, that is also something that you know people keep in mind while designing these uh, or while allocating these inputs to different stages. Now there is also something which is called fan out. So fan out is nothing but you know number of gates which are connected to the output of a driving gate. Suppose there is a gate in the previous stage and it is driving multiple similar gates or multiple different gates. Then if there are n such gates, n such load gates which are being driven, then the fan out of the circuit is m. Now as I told you that you know in all these digital circuits, so in digital circuits typically what happens? There is a gate. And that gate drives several other gates. It is connected to several other gates, and it is driving several other gates. The output of one gate is kind of input to several other gates. And since these gates are made up of MOSFETs, and I told that you know in a MOSFET you have a metal oxide and a semiconductor, so you always have that capacitor at the input, right? Because inputs are applied to the gate, and at the gate, if you see, it's like metal oxide semiconductor. So there is a dielectric, there is an oxide layer between your metal and the semiconductor, which acts like the bottom of the input. So there, there's always a capacitor that you know is connected to the output of this gate. So input of all these gates, since they are MOSFET based, so it is a capacitance. So if these capacitors are kind of connected in parallel, you can assume that you know the effective capacitance over here increases because capacitance in parallel add up, right? So because of a gate driving several other drive, like logic gates or several other load gates, what happens is capacitance increases over here. Capacitance increases on this node point. At here, and once the capacitance increases, you know that you know once the capacitance increases, the speed will go down because your driving gate is capable only providing some certain amount of current. If the capacitance is increasing, 
then the speed or i would say i by c factor or you know the slew rate of the circuit or, or i would say the speed of the circuit the rate at which you can charge or discharge that capacitor since the capacitance has increased that will reduce right so the speed actually reduces and also the logic levels may change so you think about it how exactly logic levels can also change so ideally what you want for analog circuits you saw in e210 then you know you should have large input resistance so that you know you can consume very small amount of current from the supply and you should have a very small output resistance why small output resistance so that you know there is no self loading effect and you can you know uh, drive several of these states together so even here we want ideally large number of fan outs so ideally we want that you know our gate should be able to drive infinite number of different fan outs but just because you know the capacitance and all increase here it speed degrades and also the logic levels may shift and because of these reasons what happens is in typical circuit designs we have like in the library that we make i mean in semi custom design also when you make a library for any of these gates we specifically define the maximum fan outs that can be supported by this gate so as to ensure correct static and dynamic operation by correct static and dynamic operation i mean that you know we we specify that okay this gate works with the, like this gate will you know introduce this amount of delay but that delay is subjected to you know this maximum fan out because if the fan out it increases beyond this specified maximum fan out then it won't be able to you know match those delay criterions or that energy criteria so in the libraries we specifically mention about the maximum fan out that can be you know supported by each of the driving gates now let us look at what exactly do we like you know call an ideal digital gate so we shall take the simple case of an inverter like we have already discussed about the vtc of inverter so that would be easy to comprehend so let us see how exactly an ideal inverter looks so this is the vtc of an ideal inverter so if you look at here like if you look here carefully what i mean is you know the gain in the transition region should be infinite what that ensures that ensures that you know it like the switching is pretty abrupt the moment it reaches this vm value it switches abruptly however in when this gain is like infinite then you see that there is no slope of one or minus one here and we like you know we define the vih or vil where you know the slope is minus one ideally where the slope is minus one there we will have vih and vil but that is just one way of defining it for practical vtc but what exactly that vih or vil defines is you know so in this region typically the gain is pretty small right so it is attenuating region in this region the gain is large so it is amplifying region so vih and vil form the boundary between this attenuating region and the amplifying region so that is so vih and vil basically demarcate or they form the points or boundaries between attenuating regions and the amplifying regions and that is why and how will you define that boundary typically that boundary is when you know when the gain is unity before below that it's attenuating after that it's amplifying so that is why which select a kind of dv out by dv in as one mod of that is one it can be minus one for the case of inverters can be one for the case of buffers or non inverting amplifiers or non inverting buffers or not amplifiers so here you see that since minus one is not coming here still since this point defines the boundary between attenuated like attenuated region and the amplified region so this becomes your vih and same becomes your vil so here vih and vil both are located at vdd by 2 also you are switching like inverter is switching threshold voltage that is vm that is also located at vdd by 2 so once this is the case and you know your vol is zero your voh is vdd so it's swinging from your supply voltage till the ground so you have maximum v swing which is vdd you have input noise margin like nml here is vil minus vol that is what that is vdd by 2 what is your nmh nmh is vdd minus vdd by 2 that is voh minus vih which is simply vdd by 2 so here you have symmetric noise margins like nml equals to nmh and both are equal to vdd by 2 or v swing by 2 and here v swing is vdd so this is the ideal case and also your switching threshold voltage is at the middle of the logic swing that is at vdd by 2 high and low noise margins are equal to half the swing and they are equal they are symmetric that is also a good point also for an ideal digital gate you would ideally want your input impedance to be infinity and output impedance to be zero so once its output impedance is zero it can track like it can drive 
almost unlimited fan outs. That's not possible because there is always a impedance like associated at the output. But ideally, you would want that a gate should be capable of driving infinite number of outputs. That is unlimited. It should, it should be able to support unlimited fan outs. So these characteristics are not obtainable. Like these are not very easy to obtain. There is only one design, which is static CMOS inverter design, which we'll be discussing in a like in fair details in the next module. That shows characteristics which are close to it. I mean, G equals to infinity is not there, but VOLG is equal to VDD. Their VOL is equal to zero. And you know, noise margins are kind of symmetric and they are pretty large. I mean, they're not VDD by two, but they are pretty close. The gain is not infinity. That's the only reason why it's, you know, uh, and VM is also located close to VDD by two. So CMOS, like static CMOS inverter, it presents a case which is pretty close to this. It's something like this. Rest other designs of C like inverter, which people started with, like only NMOS based design, resistor based design, and all those things, they show up, you know, uh, VTC, which is highly deviated from this. So we'll be discussing, we'll be taking them one after other. We'll be looking at how, you know, the design of these inverters evolved over time in the next point. Now, once you have discussed about these ideal digital gates, let us also look at two main performance parameters. So these are like, you know, only three performance parameters, uh, you know, people focus more on. One is cost, second is your speed, and third is your power. So now let us discuss about the speed factor or the performance factor. So performance is generally represented as computational ability. So computational ability, what exactly it is? So for processes, let's say if you are talking about microprocessors, since they are most popular kind of you know, digital circuits that we work with. So for microprocessors, this performance or computation ability is measured in terms of floating point operations per second or number of instructions which they are able to execute per second. So why floating point instructions or floating point operations per second? So in computers, typically, you know, the computations are performed on floating point, like uh, the number system uses floating point. So we have floating point operations per second which or flops. So this flops is a very common term in the industry. So whenever you compare CPUs, they compare in terms of flops, this much flops, that much flop or something like that. So that is one of the uh, kind of quantities to measure or, you know, to benchmark one, C one microprocessor against the other. And it's kind of related to the number of instructions that you can execute per second. Now, see, uh, since we are talking about microprocessor, so here, apart from the contribution of the individual logic gates, the architecture also plays a major role, right? Because nowadays you have multi-core processors where you know different things are done in parallel. So because of this pipelining and other multi-core system, you can actually, or because of these architectural artifacts, what you can do is you can perform multiple instructions parallelly. So some part of those multiple instructions parallelly. I mean, you cannot do you know uh, same part of the instructions parallelly because they require same resources and that cannot be you know uh, time multiplexed. So what people do is typically the instructions are you know divided into several uh, smaller operations and those operations are pipeline so because of that pipelining you achieve like massive level of parallelism this will be discussed in detail you know when we will we'll be discussing about data path and register transfer and all those towards the end of this course but just understand that you know you can achieve instruction level parallelism so you can execute several instruction or parts of several instructions parallelly and that is dependent upon the architecture of your processor. Pipelining is one of the methods to uh, introduce parallelism. Also, multi-core systems nowadays you have multi-core, so you have uh, instructions executed or parts of instruction executed over different cores of your CPU. So that is also something. But these kind of uh, you know uh, become part of the architectural level design. You can also uh, also the number of instructions or flops depends upon this as well as the design of the circuit. How fast your circuit is. That also dictates since these circuits or these logic gates are kind of you know the basic building blocks of any system. So the speed of the system will also depend upon how fast your systems react to, to you know uh, the input stimuli or I would say how fast your circuits can work. So that is something which we kind of uh, like attribute to this performance. So the performance is dependent both on architecture as well as on the design of the individual circuits, and it is kind of you know dependent on the duration of the clock period. So, as I told you, these processors are also, apart from flops, they're also kind of, you know, <clears throat> characterized on the basis of what is their clock frequency. 
for instance as i told you in the second lecture that you know uh, 10 years down the line it was like 10 years before it was 3.1 gigahertz so your clock frequency was 3.1 gigahertz and now it's 4.1 gigahertz and it can also be you know like it is you can increase it till till 4.3 gigahertz that's the limit but not always i mean uh, there are some cases in which only you can uh, like increase the clock frequency to 4.3 gigahertz so the duration of clock period is also something that dictates your performance why so because you know in the first lecture itself i told you <clears throat> that these clocks these clocks the transition of low to high of the clock or high to low of the clock that is used for synchronization of events which are happening inside your chip right so since these events are kind of synchronized with the help of this clock even the clock frequency kind of dictates the performance of your uh, you know uh, circuits now what exactly uh, determines this clock period so this clock period is not only determined by you know the uh, kind of time which it takes for signal to propagate through the gate but it also depends upon the time for which time which it takes for the data to get input into the register or to extract data out of the register because typically in your microprocessors you also have some kind of memory right uh, your instructions are also stored somewhere so signal propagates through the clock it also gets to the uh, register i mean the data is fed to the register it is also extracted from the registers and also clock uncertainty this also i discussed when i was discussing you know that you know uh, because of these propagation delay introduced by the interconnects because these interconnects are also some wires placed close to each other so they also introduce some capacitance and because of that this clock signal since it is going to all the gates within the design because of the delay in the path or because of the larger interconnects so the gates which are located far off from the input clock source they will suffer from a larger delay because of this you know uh, coupling or that capacitance so because of this what happens the clock reaches different gates which are located at different positions in the circuit at different times and that clock uncertainty also has to be included while defining this you know uh, appropriate clock period for a entire chip so these are the three parameters that kind of determine the duration of a clock period and we'll be discussing them in pretty detail when we'll be looking at you know sequential circuit design <clears throat> so what exactly is the propagation delay i mean we are talking about you know signal propagation time through gate so the parameter which characterizes this is called propagation delay so it simply answers this question how quickly your gate is responding to change in the inputs so how quickly your output is responding to the change in any of the inputs and that is kind of dictated by your propagation delay <clears throat> it also expresses the delay that you know a signal experiences when it passes through the gate so that is what it basically uh, like you know it relates to the delay which is experienced by a signal when it passes through the gate here let us take the simple case of an inverter so this is the kind of input waveform which we are applying and you can see we have divided this into 10% 50% 90% so these points have some value i'll be discussing what exactly is the value of these points so if you see here once the input is zero the output is high it's actually v out it's kind of you know cluttered here <clears throat> so this v in when it is low the output is high as the input starts transition you see that the output transitions only after some delay because there is a particular time which is called the response time which this gate takes or there is when the signal propagates through this gate it kind of takes some time in order to reach its output so the output transition is kind of shifted from the input transition or what i would say is the change in the input leads to a change in the output only after a certain time which is kind of called <clears throat> the delay introduced by this gate and this is something which is known as propagation delay again when it is high you see that the output is low and again when it transits from high to low then you see only after a certain time period you see a change or a transition in the output from low to high so what are these transition times and what are what are these propagation delays now how is this propagation delay measured so it is measured between 50% transition point of the input and output so let us take this case by case so here we see that you know input is rising so input is transitioning from logic level 0 to logic level high and here the output is also transitioning from logic level high to logic level low so we take 50% of the transition from of the input like 50% point of the transition of the input and 50% time of the transition of the output and then the difference between the two 
kind of represents your propagation delay when the output is transitioning from high to low. Why we are calling this EPHL high to low? It could also have been called as you know EPLH because input is transitioning from low to high. But it is a convention in these digital circuits to relate these delays always to the output transition. So whenever the output is transitioning from high to low, the difference between the input 50% and the output 50% that will give you EPHL. That is your high to low transition propagation delay of the output. Similarly, once the input transitions from high to low and the output transitions from low to high since it's an inverting circuit, so 50% of this input transition to 50% 50, 50 of this output transition, that will be termed as propagation delay of low to high. Low to high of what? Low to high of output. So that is the convention. You always look at the output while defining these TPHL values or TPLX values. Now you may be wondering that, you know, why we have these two, you know, uh, these two kind of uh, propagation delays defined. One could have, you know, defined only TPHL and worked around that. So what exactly happens is, you know, there can be different response of these gates depending upon the design of these logic gates. There can be different response time of the logic gate when the input is rising or the input is falling. So depending upon that, the values of TPHL and TPLH can be different. And that is why we have defined two different propagation delays, TPHL and TPLH. Now you may be wondering why 50%? Because typically the switching threshold voltage is at 50%. So that is why we choose this 50% transition between the input and the output. One more thing that you know, typically the duty cycle is also 50%. I'll discuss that in the latest time, but uh, why 50%? The main reason is that you know, since the VM is ideally situated, at 50% of the input. So we take 50% of the input to the 50% of the output. Because this output is also going to be input of some other gate, right? Because these are cascaded, like anywhere you'll have multiple gates cascaded together. So this is the reason why we have two propagation delays. So what is TPHL? As I already discussed, it's the response time for the gate when the input goes from low to high or the output goes from high to low. So the circuit can have, you know, so the circuit here can be inverting as well as non-inverting. So if you depend upon input transition, then that will also create confusion. That is one of the reasons also why we use output transition. Output going from high to low, <clears throat> when the output is going from high to low, then we define that response time that, you know, uh, whatever response time the circuit takes for output to go from high to low, that will define as TPHL and whatever response time the circuit's output takes from low to high transition that we define as TPLH. And then we define average propagation delay, which is known as TP or the propagation delay. So this average propagation delay is something that we call propagation delay of the gate. And that is defined as TPHL plus TPLH divided by. So we take the average of these two propagation delays and that is kind of, you know, given as the average propagation delay of the gate. Now you may be wondering, why this, like, does this TP always represent the exact amount of delay that you observe when you, you know, measure the performance or when you measure the characteristics of the gate? So that's actually not true. This TP or average propagation delay is just a gate quality metric. And this is used to benchmark different technologies, like circuits made in different technologies, different logic designs, and different systems. So this is just a quality metric. This does not represent the exact value of delay that will be introduced by that key, this average propagation delay. However, you can, like for a first hand calculation, this is perfectly fine. And it can tell you the order of magnitude of the delay of the exact circuit. Order of magnitude remains same. For instance, if by calculating this average TP or average propagation delay, you find out that it's two nanosecond, then you can assume that the circuit's delay will be from two nanoseconds to 10 nanoseconds. I mean, it would be less than 10 nanoseconds. So the order of magnitude is kind of given correctly by this gate quality metric. And that is how people, you know, generally benchmark it. Benchmark across technologies, benchmark across logic designs, that is comparison. Benchmarking is simply comparison. Now this propagation delay is, you know, also a function of the slope of input and the output. So it also depends upon something which is known as rise time and fall time of the input as well as output. So what exactly is the rise and fall time? How do you define it? So this rise and fall times are defined or they kind of, they're defined as,
Moreover, you know, this propagation delay, average propagation delay, is also a function of the slope of input and output. So, how do we characterize these slopes? So, these slopes are characterized with the help of rise and fall times. So, this TR, TF, TTHL, and TTLH, they represent the rise time of, so this TR represents the rise time of the input, TF represents the fall time of the input, TTHL represents the fall time of, you know, the output, and TTLH represents the rise time of the output. So these, you know, uh, these rise times or fall times, what do they exactly tell you? So they exactly tell you how fast a signal transits between different logic levels. Now, how fast a signal transits between different logic levels is also a function of, you know, strength of the driving gate and the load that we have, right? Because how fast a signal transits, that's dependent upon I with which you are charging that capacitor as well as the C, that is an effective load capacitance value. So it's dependent upon both. Again, we take the rise time or the fall time, we define it as, you know, 10% to 90% of, you know, the change in input. 10% VDD to 90% VDD here. Now, is it defined from 10% to 90% of the like maximum amplitude of the logic? This is just to avoid any uncertainty over, you know, when transition occurs or when it ends. So that is why we define with a margin of, you know, 10% to 90 percent also because of this finite rise and fall times of the input there is an additional delay component which is introduced and that we shall see when we look at you know the inverter propagation delay and the combinatorial design will when we go through the modules we'll actually look at that now another question which arises over here is how fast we can toggle the clock so what exactly do we mean by toggling the clock since all the events are kind of you know synchronized with a low to high transition or a high to low transition of the clock so toggling the clock simply means going from low to high or high to low. So what is the frequency or what is the time period for toggling the clock? That is something which is also dependent upon this propagation delay or the average propagation delay. But typically, if we have symmetric, if we have symmetric TPHL and TPLH characteristics, which means TPHL is equal to TPLH, and you know this TP is nothing but TPLH or TPHL. So in that case, we have typically this time period for toggling greater than two into max of TP. So why max of TP? Because you know when you are talking about circuits or digital systems, then they consist of several circuits. So each of those circuits would be characterized by different TP. And we are considering that all of those like circuits are individual circuits are symmetric. So for that case, this T has to be greater than twice of maximum of that TP. Maximum of TP means the gate which is showing the maximum delay, the clock period should be greater than twice of that. So why exactly twice? Since this TP is defined as you know TPHL plus TPLH by two, so that two and two cancels, and hence we have T greater than max of TPLH plus TPHL of the worst kind of circuit or the worst circuit in terms of speed. So that is typically how it is defined. So if we have you know, maximum TP as let's say 50 picosecond. So does that mean that our clock frequency would be, you know, greater than just 100 picosecond or the clock period would be greater than 100 picosecond? No. Typically what happens is, you know, there are several other factors like different fan ins, fan outs and all those things. And also clock certain, like clock uncertainties and all those things. And just to take like, and taking them into account, typically the clock period is like 50 to 100 times that of maximum TP, price of maximum TP. So that is typically how it is taken yeah, for a system design. Also, why we make it symmetric? Because you know, typically the clocks have 50% duty cycle. That is 50% of time they are on, that is they remain in logic level one, and 50% of the time they remain in logic level zero. So most of the digital systems work with clocks with have which have duty cycle of 50%. So as to have, so as to get you know a symmetric kind of waveform, when the clock is symmetric, we generally make we try to achieve TPHL equals to TPLH. How so? We kind of, you know, since these delays are kind of dependent upon RC values, so I'll discuss how exactly these TPLH and TPLHL are dependent upon, you know, uh, the resistance of the MOSFETs and the load capacitance. And by just matching those values, they kind of make these TPHL and TPLH equal. Just because, you know, these DP cycles are typically symmetric, like 50% and the clocks are symmetric. So we want our circuit to have symmetric value of TPHL and TPLH. Now, how can we compare performance or speed of two different technologies? 
So the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that, you know, we need to have same fan in and same fan out. And also the other loading factors that we have for two technologies that should be uniform while comparison. Okay. And one of the standard circuit, which is kind of used for comparing two different technologies is a ring oscillator, which is used for benchmarking. So what exactly is a ring oscillator? So ring oscillator consists of an odd number of inverters connected in a circular fashion. For instance, here we have one, two, three, four, five. That is an odd number of inverter where the output of the last inverter is kind of connected to the input of the first. So we have like this kind of inverters are kind of arranged in the form of a ring and the output of the last stage is kind of being fed as the input to the first stage. So this is called, you know, a ring oscillator and how exactly it works as an oscillator. So what happens is since you have odd number of these, uh, like odd number of inverters. So let's say V0 is zero, then V1 would be one, V2 will be zero, V3 would be one, V4 would be zero, V5 will be one. However, this one at V5 takes some time to reach, like, you know, this signal zero, it takes one, two, three, four, five five times TP or the five times propagation delay of this inverter, it takes for this signal V0, that was zero, to reach here as one. So at V5, so since V0 is kind of zero initially, however, after five TP, this V5 starts to become one, right? Because as this signal zero propagates along this chain, after five times TP, it becomes one over here. And once this becomes one, then it tries to force this to one this input to be one. And now once it forces this input to be one, then this input one gets transferred as zero here, then it gets transferred as one here, then again zero, then again one, and then again zero. And now this zero output here, after again five PP time, will kind of force this input to go to the zero state. So this system oscillates between zero and one, and the time period of oscillation, it's simply given by two times N into TP. So TP is propagation delay of single inverter, then it's n times TP from, for this to go from zero to one. And then for this to go from one to zero, again, five times TP, right? So n times TP plus n times TP becomes two times and two n times TP. So the complete chain, like unless this signal propagates through complete chain and goes from, you know, high to low as well as low to high, you cannot get an appropriate waveform. So this is kind of evident from here also. So the time period of this, uh, you know, ring oscillator is two into n into t. Why two? Just to, you know, capture both the effect of high to low transition as well as low to high transition of this V0 or the input. Also, so uh, there's no uh, st stable operating point in the, and it oscillates as I already told you. And period of oscillation is simply propagation time of signal through complete chain and also for input high to low and low to high. So a factor of two is also there. Another important point which I which I should mention here is that you know this is valid if and only if this like propagation time of the signal through the complete chain is pretty large as compared to you know your rise time as well as fall time. Why so? Because if this is pretty small, I mean if the propagation delay of the gate is pretty small, then before the first signal falls or rises, this you know this entire thing comes back here before this signal effectively rises or falls to its uh, like you know appropriate logic zero or logic one since the propagation delay is lower than that i mean we are considering a case where it is lower than that it's lower than tr or tf then what happens this signal again comes back here so once it comes back here then kind of sets it to an intermediate level which is stable and it doesn't oscillate anymore so this is one of the conditions which should always be satisfied whenever we are designing any ring oscillator so ring oscillators are typically designed for you know making clocks of appropriate frequency so its time period can be controlled by using you know this stages of the inverter so you can actually coordinate the clock frequency accordingly so this is one of the circuits used for making clocks then another important point that i want to make here is does a tp of 20 picosecond mean a clock frequency of 50 gigahertz like i was talking in the previous slide the answer is no so here if the ring oscillator is showing you a TP of 20 picoseconds, you cannot have a circuit or you cannot make the design to have a clock of 50 gigahertz. Why so? Because this represents the most simplest way of, you know, uh, arranging these gates. So you have fan in equals to fan out equals to one here. And even the interconnects are not placed far apart. So you have least parasitic load over here. So that is why, you know, uh, 
practical circuits are much more complex and this is only used for benchmarking different technologies so you cannot have you know 15 gigahertz clock even when your dp is 20 picosecond typically as i told you it's like achievable clock frequencies are typically 50 to 100 times slower than this uh, you know dp okay so now with this let us see how exactly we can model digital circuits very simply so all these digital circuits can be modeled as a rc network with input as step input so uh, instead of you know uh, dealing the nuances that are introduced in the circuit because of finite rise time and fault time because if you have finite rise time and fault time uh, it not only adds a delay to the system it also adds a power dissipation component so during the transition time uh, there is a period where you know there is a connection between the vdd and the ground and the current can flow so i'll discuss that when i'll be discussing you know the uh, short circuit current leakage through inverters cmos inverters but for the time being you just understand that because of this finite rise and fall time not only the delay is impacted it not only increases the delay but it also adds a in increase in the power that is the short circuit the short circuit power component whenever you have a rise finite rise time and fall time and because of that to model digital circuits for first hand calculation what people do is they assume that you know we have step input and any digital circuit or any digital system is kind of modeled as a, as a first order rc network so this input is represented as a step input this r is nothing but you know the impedance or the resistance of the mosfet and since also let me tell you that this r is variable throughout the operation of this device because as you change the gate voltage as you are applying an input voltage and as your v out changes so v out is kind of you know the drain of the mosfet i told that you know input is typically the gate output is typically the drain so when your vin is changing your v out also changes and as such you know your drain voltage changes and your mosfet goes from several different operation regions as we discussed depending upon v vds and its relationship with vgs and vt you can have either linear range of operation or you know uh, uh, saturation mode of operation so during this swinging of v out the circuit operation i mean the mosfet's operation also changes from linear to saturation and so on so this is also a variable resistance but for first hand calculations we assume that it's a you know constant resistance value and we kind of approximate its value so i'll also be deriving what exactly is this r on which we take for you know uh, representing any mosfet in the first order rc network for digital circuits that we'll be deriving when we discuss about you know the cmos inverters and what is this c c is nothing but the load capacitor what what contributes to this load capacitor it is contributed by you know internal capacitance of the mosfet like the cgt component we saw that also appears at the uh, output that is a drain and with some miller like gain as well so it's cgt plus there are other capacitance components that are introduced by this mosfet itself apart from that if this is kind of driving other gates their input gate capacitance also comes into like you know uh, comes in parallel with this and as such overall capacitance is just sum of all of them. so any digital system as such can be modeled as this you know first order rc network and we already know you know the results for this step input right that the v out is simply exponential i mean the response is exponential it's given by this formula right v out is equals to 1 minus e raised to the minus t by tau what is tau tau is simply rc this r is variable so that r we approximate as r on and that r on is kind of approximated by choosing only a particular range of the voltages that v out is kind of dropping to that i'll discuss later but for the time being just understand that mosfet is represented as this resistance value r like that channel resistance is kind of represented as this r and the c is nothing but the load capacitance total load capacitance consisting of external loads that is the other gates which are connected as well as the internal capacitance components of those mosfets so all those components together clubbed together it's taken as c so the time constant is rc over here now what we are interested in is like what we are interested in these circuits first we are interested in how much time it takes to reach the logic like reach 50% of the output right so that is you know 50% like v out is 0.5 times the input so time to reach 50% that determines your tp lh as well as tp hn so it's simply given by you know tp equals to ln 2 times tau and you get this 0.69 rc so this 0.69 rc is equals to tp hl and equals to tp lh now if you know the value of r which we approximate and if you know the value of c for first hand calculation we can always use this 0.69 rc value as you know either a tp lh value or the tp hl value <coughs> now again this is a huge approximation i would say that you know uh, it 
cannot guarantee you the exact values which you get while measurements but the order of magnitude when you approximate these two first order rc network is actually same so as long as you can get order of magnitude same you can compare different technologies right with this with the help of this kind of first order rc networks so that is the advantage of this also we are interested in you know time to reach 90% right so time to reach 90% is what it it defines your rise and fall times so rise and fall times also like this tthl and ttlh which are the rise and fall times of the output they are nothing but ln 9 times t and which comes out as 2.2 times rc 2.2 times tau or 2.2 times rc so these values are pretty important to remember because especially this 0.69 rc time taken to go to 50% this is something which will be using frequently when we discuss about the propagation delay of inverters so you should remember that tplh or tphl is simply given by this 0.69 times rc when we are you know using this first order rc network where this r has been modeled as the resistance of the mosfet and this c clubs all the load capacitances okay so with this discussion about you know speed and all let's go and discuss about this power and energy as well which is another important parameter which is dictating you know the dynamics of the circuit design nowadays so power consumption basically determines both the energy consumed per operation as well as the heat dissipated by the circuit so this power consumption consideration it kind of modulate or influences the power supply the battery life time the supply line size and also you know the packaging requirements of the chip or the cooling requirements of the system so this power consumption basically influences these aspects and also restricts the number of circuits integrated on chip so let's say each of the circuit dissipates a particular amount of heat if your packaging is not able to sustain the summation of all the heat then it restricts the amount of or the number of circuits that can be integrated on a chip and also this power consumption actually restricts the switching frequency as well because you know the switching frequency kind of dictates this power so if your circuit can handle only this much amount of heat dissipation or only you know the power supply rails can handle only this much amount of power then even the switching frequency cannot be increased so power is an important consideration because it also limits the number of circuits which can be integrated on chip or number of gates which can be integrated on the chip and also the frequency at which they can be operated also you know the yeah as i told it also influences power supply or battery life time supply line size packaging and cooling requirements and also you know chip package which chip packages to be used and what kind of heat removal system do we require for instance in your servers you know that you know even coolants need to be passed or you know you need very uh, like good rooms like rooms with good temperature control that is acs and all or even fans are sometimes you know used to cool down this servers so heat removal systems and all that is also dictated by this power supply now there are two kinds of powers like there are two metrics i would say not two kinds of powers there are two metrics one is called the peak power so peak power is something that you want to know because you don't want to damage your circuit so this peak power depending upon this peak power you kind of size your supply line so that you know those lines are able to sustain those peak power it do not it does not melt because of that peak power so what how exactly do you define this peak power peak power you define this as simply the supply times the maximum current that can be like you know uh, extracted from the supply i peak is maximum current which can be like extracted from the supply and it's maximum of the instantaneous power so this pt is the instantaneous power so the peak power is nothing but maximum of the instantaneous value of the power and it's given by vdd times i peak where i peak is the maximum value of supply current or the current that you can extract from the supply now apart from that you know uh, the cooling requirements or the battery life time that depends on a parameter which is called average power dissipation so what exactly is average power dissipation so average power dissipation or let's say the instantaneous power dissipation is nothing but v times i right here v is nothing but you know the vdd which is the supply voltage times i which is you know the current which is extracted from the supply or drawn from the supply so average power is nothing but you know you just average out this instantaneous power over a time duration 0 to t so it's simply given by 1 by t integration from 0 to dt dt and since we know the value of v is vdd so it's vdd by t 0 to time t it dt so here i peak is also kind of you know the maximum current that is drawn from the supply between this 0 to t interval so this is how you know you define this average power dissipation and this average power dissipation 
kind of dictates you know your battery lifetime or the cooling requirements of the system now there are also two kinds of power dissipations that i discussed in the first lecture itself by discussing about the scaling so one is static power dissipation so static power dissipation what exactly is it so static simply means there is no switching of inputs so when there is no switching of inputs then the static power dissipation simply comes because of you know if there are conducting path between the vdd and the ground like if there is a path for the current to flow between vdd and ground and that is static that is when, it, when input is not switching even then this path is existing then this leads to static power dissipation then also we have something which is called dynamic power dissipation why dynamic because you know it it occurs only when you know the gate is switching so only during the gate switching event we have this dynamic power dissipation so what exactly contributes to this dynamic power dissipation so first is charging of capacitor from the supply so whenever the load capacitor so yeah as i told the capacitor like the load in these digital circuits is typically taken as a capacitance so these capacitance whenever they charge so for if the load is a capacitor output like logic level 1 simply means that you know this capacitor has to be charged to vdd so whenever this capacitor will be charged to vdd it will extract some amount of charge from the supply and the energy dissipated is simply the charge extracted multiplied by the voltage across the capacitor so that is something which contributes to this dynamic power also there can be a temporary path between supply rails during this transition especially when when you have you know uh, i would say finite rise and fall times then there is a temporary path between supply rails during the transition of input or during the gate switching event so these two components this contributes to short circuit leakage so these two contributions typically make the dynamic power dissipation and since it is dependent upon gate switching event larger the number of switching events larger the dynamic power dissipation that is it is proportional to switching frequency also as i discussed earlier you know this dynamic power was the kind of dominating power i mean earlier you can see that when the gate lengths were larger this dynamic power was the dominating power and the static leakage or the static uh, power dissipation was pretty smaller but as you have scaled down the gate lengths you can see that now the static is like the dynamic is less than the static and this is something which is now the major concern for circuit designer the static power dissipation is larger or it is dominant and the dynamic power dissipation is smaller so typical examples of you know uh, this dynamic power is whenever your battery goes low you see that the system kind of becomes slower why so because when the battery is smaller then you want to dissipate less amount of dynamic power since the dynamic power depends upon the number of switching activities so you know you go to standby where you know your switching activities are smaller or the frequency reduces your switching activity or switching events become less frequent so these are few factors like when designing a system you have to take into account static power dissipation you are working on it you are continuously dissipating it and your like laptop becomes very hot so that is a contribution of static power dissipation also dynamic contributes that but static contributes larger to that now uh yeah so that is what i told i mean earlier dynamic power was dominant and now static power is dominant now let us look at the power delay product and let us try to find out answer to the question that you know are propagation delay and power consumption even related now what is propagation delay propagation delay is simply the so propagation delay is simply the speed at which the capacitor is charged or discharged right or at the same time whenever you are charging or discharging a capacitor you are kind of you know uh, you are giving an amount of energy or you are storing an amount of energy on that capacitor so propagation delay is kind of speed at which you know uh, the capacitor can be charged or the speed at which a given amount of energy can be stored on that capacitor so faster the energy transfer you will have a higher power consumption but the speed will also be faster right therefore you can say that you know this uh, like power and this propagation delay they are kind of you know related because faster the energy transfer higher the power dissipation higher the gate speed so they are related in some sense this product of this power and delay which is called as pdp power delay product that is typically constant for a given technology and for a given gate topology as well so that is one artifact that is you know constant across technologies and when you benchmark these different technologies what you do is you kind of you know pdp use pdp for benchmarking also if you look closely to this pdp you'll find that you know it is energy consumed per switching event 
So if it is the energy consumed per switching event, why why so? I mean, why it's energy consumed per switching event? So it's power multiplied by this delay, right? So power times time is simply energy, right? So it's energy consumed per switching event, and it's used for benchmarking. And even here, ring oscillator is kind of you know, uh, it's also like power delay metric is also used. Power delay product metric is also used for benchmarking different technologies. And here also, ring oscillator is one of the you know favorite I would say kind of circuits. Which are used for you know uh, benchmarking these uh, different technologies. Now, this power delay product, since it's constant for a given technology, we go for another metric, which is energy delay product. So, for an ideal gate, what you exactly want is it should be very fast, and at the same time, it should consume as less amount of energy as possible. So, this is kind of you know taken care by this energy delay product metric. So, this EDP or energy delay product, it considers both. The, uh, like you know, speed of the device as well as the energy at the same time, and hence it can be classified as the ultimate quality metric. So EDP is simply power times delay square. Now that we know about these power delay product metric or the energy delay product metric, or even you know the different modes of power dissipation that is static and dynamic, let us look at the like let us revisit the RC network model that we developed earlier. For any representing any uh, you know digital circuit, where the CL is nothing but the load capacitance consisting of you know all the input, all the like inherent transistors, like inherent capacitors, parasitic capacitances of the MOSFET as well as the external load capacitances, and this resistance is simply the resistance of a MOSFET. It is variable quantity in itself, but we are kind of modeling it, uh, and we are taking an approximation or we are kind of you know uh, limiting it to a. Uh, Interval such that you know the value of this R kind of approximates the exact value that we get from the measurements in the same order of magnitude. I mean, it cannot give you the exact value correctly, or the values obtained by this first-hand calculation in the measurements will be different, but they'll be on the same order of magnitude. So we will be looking at how exactly we can approximate this R, and yeah, the input as I told that it's considered to be a step function, and this is the only input to this circuit. So this is the input. So this is the Uh, like the circuit gets energy from this supply itself. I mean, this is the input source or the energy source of this circuit, right? Now, the energy dissipated from this energy source when the output transitions from zero to one. So let's say that initially it's discharged. So now, once you are applying, when this is going from zero to one, this will also charge from low to high, right? That that is the output will transition from low to high. So what is this energy? It's simply given by zero to t integration from zero to t p t d t where Pt is the instantaneous power, dt is the time interval. Now, since your v, v is kind of Vdt, instantaneously it goes to Vdt, so it's Vdt, and then I supply times t dt. So this I supply, which is the sub, like current that the circuit takes from the supply, which is this V in. So now, what is this I supply? Same amount of current flows through resistance and the capacitance. And what is this current through the capacitance? It's Cl Vt, like dv out by dt. So you put I supply is Cl dv out by dt, dt dt cancels, so it becomes VDD limits now change from time to voltage zero to VDD, and this becomes CL VDD. So this comes as CL VDD square. Now there's another very easy way of doing it. So the charge that this capacitor has when it is charged to VDD is CL times VDD. And what is the energy? Energy is simply charge times the voltage, right? So energy is what? The, like how much charge is kind of you know transferred across what potential difference? So the charge which has been transferred is CL times VDD. And the potential difference is VDD, so it's simply CL times VDD square. Now, if you look at the energy which is stored in this capacitor when this, you know, uh, output transitions from low to high, so output is transitioning from zero to VDD, right? So whenever the output is transitioning from zero to VDD, this is the amount of energy that is taken from the supply. Mind my words, it's zero to one transition of the output. We are referring here as output. So every time in digital circuits, even for TPLH and TPHL, we saw that we were looking at transition of the output. Here also, we'll look at the transition of the output. So once output is transitioning from zero to one, it takes in a power or it takes in an energy which is equivalent to CL VDD square, not power, it's energy. So E zero to one is always CL VDD square. Now, how much amount of this energy consumed is kind of stored in the capacitor when output transitions from zero to one? So energy of the capacitor is simply zero to T T capacitor T times T. What is P capacitor of T? So it's V out times I cap because V out is the uh, like potential difference across the capacitor. So if you like again represent this as dV out by dt, so you go ahead with this zero to V dt, CL V out, dV out, and this CL V dt square by two. 
this is a very standard equation that comes you know that whenever you have a capacitor it's charged to vdd then the amount of charge stored in the capacitor is half like half c vdd square so whenever the output transitions from 0 to 1 you have energy consumed from the supply is cl vdd square and out of this total energy only half of it is stored in the load capacitor so what happens to the other half so the other half is kind of dissipated in this resistor however you can see that you know the other half which is dissipated is half cl vdd square and it is independent of the r so whatever the r value is here that energy dissipated won't be you know dependent upon that now in the next cycle when you know this uh, load capacitor kind of like this v out goes from 1 to 0 what happens even this energy cl vdd square which was stored here that gets you know uh, dissipated to the ground so that energy also gets dissipated now here we are you know seeing that when you go from 0 to 1 you consume cl vdd square from supply half of it is stored half of it is dissipated when you go from 1 to 0 even that charge is kind of dissipated to the ground and then your half cl vdd square is also gone so when you go from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0 then you exactly dissipate an energy which is equal to cl vdd square so this is something which i need you to remember whenever you are whenever the output transitions from 0 to 1 you consume an energy which is cl vdd square half of it is stored as the load capacitor like energy in the load capacitor half of it is dissipated now when you go from 1 to 0 even that half cl vdd square gets dissipated because the charge has to put to the ground now and because of that what happens totally you kind of you know consume the energy of cl vdd square and you dissipate it so that is what happens now here we are saying that you know energy is dissipated in r what exactly would have happened if r is zero will the energy be conserved then? so the answer to this question is very tricky because when r is zero typically r is never zero even for capacitors you have some lead resistance over here i mean even the metal electrodes that are used for parallel plate capacitors they have some resistance so you always have some r but if it's zero there's a special phenomena called you know radiation so energy stored is still half cv square but half cv square is kind of dissipated in the form of radiation so energy conservation is always followed it's just that you know the form of energy changes so then if r is zero it converts to radiation space charge radiation is what it's called uh, you can go through it in details if you want but just remember that if r is zero the still half cl vd square will be dissipated and the phenomena is known as space charge like you like yeah uh, it's uh, discharge it's uh, space charge radiation 